see. It looks like we have um, quite a group that has joined us and we'd like to thank everybody for taking the time to um, get on with us today. Uh, we're excited to share um, some of our thoughts and ideas with you on public participation tools in a new world. So before we get going um, on the webinar, just a couple of um, housekeeping tips and some um, features on how to use this um, system to its fullest capacities uh, if you're not super familiar with Zoom. Um, so you do have the ability to mute and unmute yourself. Uh, we would recommend and ask that you please mute yourself if you're not speaking. Um, this will help with the audio clarity for everybody. Um, there is an option to submit Q&A questions during the webinar. Um, it's at the bottom of your screen. And we will have time at the end um, to take live questions as well. Uh, but if you have questions as we're going, if you type them into that Q&A, uh, we'll be able to see them as we go. We will probably wait till the end to answer them, um, but it will let us be prepared for that. And there is also an option to raise your hand on your Zoom controls um, to let us know that you have a question you'd like to ask um, when we get to the end and the live Q&A. So let us introduce ourselves. Um, I'm Emily Smith. I'm the Director of Transportation at Fisher Associates. And with me today, um, and they will be presenting a little bit, are Charvi Gupta from Highland Planning and Andre Primus from Highland Planning as well. So the purpose of this um, webinar today and what we're hoping um, you can, you'll get out of it is the importance of public participation to all of our projects. Um, the current FHWA and NISDOT guidance on public participation um, in this current COVID setting, um, as well as a discussion on the current tools that are available. Um, and we're hoping to have plenty of time for questions at the end. So why is public engagement important? Um, it's important because of accountability. Um, we want to be open and transparent about what we're spending public money on with the constituents um, and the stakeholders on, in your communities. And we want to have help you have an open and two-way conversation about you know, what we're doing and why we're doing it on the different projects. Um, for values and purpose, um, in today's age, a lot of people expect organizations to live by their values. And one of those values um, often drives public engagement, which is a commitment to a wider social benefit and to have that dialogue um, along those same lines. It also makes projects better and more sustainable uh, when you get that um, community engagement and buy-in up front. Certainly, it will help build trust. You know, trust is hard won and easily eroded. And the public engagement is a mindset that acknowledges that the public has a genuine stake in what you're doing and the improvements that you're looking to make in a community. It provides relevance that dialogue through dialogue and open-ended, you know, curiosity-driven conversations and collaboration, it makes the project relevant to everybody involved. And it helps you provide responsiveness by positively building those relationships and creating that dialogue um, and partnership as you go. So as for FHWA and NISDOT, um, for those of you that we've worked with on you know, federal aid projects, you'll know that as part of the you know, NEPA process, public engagement is a requirement. Um, and so there is um, a lot of different thoughts out there about what that should look like and what it needs to look like. Um, FHWA does not actually have uh, COVID specific guidance out yet. Um, they are currently taking it under advisement, um, but they have indicated that whatever communities choose to do in the meantime um, is, you know, will be approved as your best judgment. With the understanding though, that virtual public meetings do not relieve the sponsor of compliance with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. And so it is important as we look at public engagement in these times um, to consider um, how we reach everybody. And that includes you know, potentially underserved populations or as the statistic indicates, only about three quarters of Americans have smartphones. 
Um, so relying on engagement that would be done, you know, primarily through those tools um, does not get you in contact with everybody. And so they do strongly advise utilizing, you know, the mail system or some of the, what we'll say, old, older, old-fashioned ways of doing public engagement um, that are still very current and relevant. So uh, what were we doing before this? You know, before we all got into this weird world of social distancing and, uh, you know, before it impacted all of our project timelines, uh, how were we looking at engagement? Um, four of the main things that we were doing and uh, the things that we need to think about now uh, replacing uh, with uh, things that are compatible with social distancing are presentations, meetings, surveys, and go to them strategies. And the reason I'm uh, highlighting those four is because they work in slightly different ways. Presentations really about sharing information uh, at, their, at their basis. Office, we were, often we were doing these at uh, public meetings or focus groups or something like that. Uh, but that's about sharing information uh, with interested groups, people who uh, might show up at a public meeting because they already know about your project or groups that you selected to reach out to, you know, groups that have specific um, impacts uh, like a bicycle advocacy group or something, if you're doing a bike uh, project, something like that. Um, meetings were about gathering info, uh, gathering information from uh, interested or selected groups. Again, uh, those same sort of groups of people, people who already knew about your project, decided to show up at your meeting, or people that you reached out to. Um, surveys were about gathering that sort of basic information. Um, instead of that kind of in-depth information that you would get from a real one-on-one -on -one, uh, or uh, you know, really conversational connection. It's about gathering basic information from people about their preferences and things like that. Uh, and then uh, go to them strategies, um, which is something that Highland uses a lot, is about gathering some more in-depth information from the uninterested individuals, the people who might not have known your project was happening at all. Um, to be able to show up at places where people gather in large crowds, like uh, farmers markets and uh, libraries and events and things like that, and say, hey, we're here, we're looking for information. I don't know if you knew, but the parcel down the street is being redeveloped, and they're looking for, you know, uh, input on what sort of um, architectural style should go in there, things like that. Um, that is one of the hardest ones to replace now. And we'll talk about that a little more because obviously people are not gathering in large groups. Um, but uh, those are the sort of four things we need to think about. Gathering in-depth information, gathering basic information, sharing information, and really reaching out to people who didn't already know about the project. Um, so what are some social distancing compatible tools? Um, the tools that we're using right now, I think, really separate into two different uh, categories. And this relates to uh, what Emily said, um, virtual engagement tools and non-virtual engagement tools. Uh, and I'm, we're basically separating that way. Um, really what it means is uh, systems that work for people who have access to internet connections and have the expertise required to use those internet connections and systems that are for people who don't have those internet connections or don't have that expertise. Um, and so virtual meetings, virtual presentations, surveys, things like that will fall under virtual engagement. Um, whereas uh, radio and TV uh, mailings, things like that would be non-virtual. You don't necessarily need an internet connection uh, to be able to access those. Um, so to talk a little bit more about the, uh, the those different tools, um, you will note that in the chat box, uh, we pasted a link to a, uh, a Google Doc that Highland Planning develops that basically lists all of the tools that we've been evaluating and it's ongoing um, as new tools come out. I, uh, for instance, uh, Google Meet has just been, made, um, uh, just been made free to all instead of being restricted to their, um, their specific customers. Uh, and so that's gonna be rolling out in the next few days. And so we'll be testing that and evaluating that and trying to understand whether it's a, you know, a useful uh, tool for things like this. Um, so that's an ongoing evolving document, um, but I'm just gonna highlight some of the top tools we have and some of the uh, things in each of those, but you can always go to that document for more information. Um, but one of the things that we highlight for having a meeting, uh, you know, when you're really required to have a meeting uh, is a Zoom webinar, which is what we're on right now. 
It has some great features. Um, it offers video and phone conferencing. I think some of you are joining us by phone. Um, it integrates with Facebook and YouTube. You can actually stream uh, a webinar or a meeting directly to Facebook or YouTube so that uh, people who may not be able to quite figure out how to install the Zoom link and things like that uh, can still access it. Um, it enables you to screen share as we're doing currently uh, to show slides and things like that. It has reporting and analytics to let you kind of understand who's there, it has chat, Q&A, polling, um, attendees can raise their hand. Um, you know, some of these are a little more uh, complicated. Uh, for instance, if you are on your phone uh, and you want to raise your hand, but you're joining by phone, uh, you need to know the right codes and stuff to, you know, in, uh, in order to do that. Um, so it's not a perfect system uh, that works just how you would with uh, uh, just how you would with in person, you know, uh, I mean, some pros are the built in comment system, the persistent persistent identities, you can figure out who people are, um, and it automatically hosts your video, but it does require a login to comment to send questions. Uh, and especially if you are live streaming it to uh, YouTube or Facebook, people will need to have those accounts if they want to be able to interact with your meeting. Um, and if they don't have those accounts, they're not able to send you a comment or send you a question. Um, so this is something that uh, is, I think, uh, we think strikes a good balance between power and affordability. There are some more powerful tools like this, um, like uh, publicinput.com and some other things. Um, but uh, Zoom is relatively affordable um, uh, compared to some of those that are uh, more expansive. And so it's one of the ones that we recommend in general for something like a public meeting. Um, but you can also do virtual presentations. When we're thinking about sharing information, you don't necessarily need to be in a live setting like this to share information. Uh, and so instead of virtual meetings, uh, we've been uh, recommending that you have uh, rather virtual presentations that have uh, extended comment periods and surveys attached to them. So think about, you know, at a public meeting, you would have a, a presentation and then a Q&A and then maybe some activities um, instead, you can film your presentation, uh, whether it be a person talking or whether you uh, use um, something like a you know, more in-depth video where you actually have animations and things like that, or whether you just use a slide deck. Um, there's ways to film a presentation and put it out there so people can watch it and then attach a survey that people can drop in their comments. This really allows people to interact at their own time. They don't necessarily need to block out time to make your Zoom meeting. You know, if they have, uh, you know, if they're having dinner at that time or they have other things going on. Um, and so this really uh, gives it more flexible for your stakeholders and for the public. Um, but you just got to make sure that you're including the right questions. Um, that you have to uh, indicate where your participants can send their comments. You don't necessarily need your participants to send the comments into a survey. Um, even just if you're posting it, say you have a relatively popular Facebook page for your municipality, um, you can post the video and say, put your comments on the Facebook video. Uh, and then you can re react to them there or take them and store them and uh, react to them in writing somewhere else. Um, so you can kind of get flexible the way you're using these. Um, and you can post them again to the project website, Facebook, YouTube. You can share them by email. We've actually shared uh, presentations by mail in a few of our projects where we actually had uh, printed out the PowerPoint presentation and sent it to somebody who we knew weren't going to get it any other way um, so that we could call them and ask them what they thought about it. Uh, you know, this is a way to reach out to people who wouldn't otherwise um, be able to get information. Uh, and that's sort of how you get that in-depth information from people sometimes. Um, but thinking about surveys uh, that you're attaching to these presentations, um, we're generally considering more smaller surveys rather than one large survey. We've been doing uh, virtual meeting exit surveys um, where after we have a meeting like this, uh, we have it automatically direct people to an exit survey so it can kind of ask them, hey, what did you think? What worked well? What didn't work well? Um, what questions do you have about the content that was, uh, that was prepared? Uh, things like that. Um, comment forms on draft documents, uh, having separate surveys for Q&A. Uh, we we're doing a project right now where we have a survey where people can just ask questions about the project before they give their recommendations. And once a week, we're updating the website with the responses to their questions so that everyone can see them and they know, oh, uh, now I have that clarified. Now I want to go back to the other survey that has some information on 
uh, or where I can share some information on what I think about the project. And so um, being able to kind of simulate the many touch points you would have if you were doing things like going out and talking to people at smaller meetings and things like that with more smaller surveys rather than just sending one survey out and saying, I hope that covered everybody uh, is something that we are, are thinking about. Uh, and, you know, we're also incorporating social media, uh, letting people, as I said, discuss uh, specifically on posts is something you can do. And also, you can just mail people paper surveys if you have the right resources for that. Um, I think that the, uh, uh, the main thing that we should be thinking about, though, is uh, how do we get into non-virtual engagement? How do we connect with people who don't have those internet connections? Um, because uh, hopefully a lot of these things a lot of these digital systems we've already been incorporating even before these, uh, the pandemic hit, we started doing all the social distancing. Um, but, you know, using things like radio and TV, um, I think are really uh, important and people haven't been using them as much. Uh, you know, many municipalities have access to a TV or radio station um, and they can host a, a meeting with live polling or something like that. Um, I know that um, often that can be streamed online simultaneously. Uh, there are tools like uh, publicinput.com uh, or uh, Poll Everywhere or Text is In uh, that allow people to actually text in responses uh, so you can have something come up on the screen that says, uh, right now we're talking about, um, you know, the, whether this street should have bike lanes or bus lanes and text in whether you think bike lanes, bus lanes, A or B to this six digit number. Uh, you can actually incorporate that directly into a live TV meeting so people don't need an internet connection. They just need TV and, you know, any phone with numbers on it will work. Uh, they can use their flip phone. They can use whatever they have. Um, and so to be able to incorporate that along with the things we already talked about, about mailing out surveys, brochures, and other materials uh, can be really powerful. Uh, and the last thing to think about there is the go to them techniques. You know, again, we're not able to show up at a uh, farmer's market because people aren't going to farmer's markets anymore, but um, there are still ways to get in front of the, the uninterested groups, the people who don't know about your project already. Uh, and the main way to do that is through advertising. Uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Google, they all have targeted advertising that they can do. Um, and uh, you can actually get your surveys or get your presentations in front of people who didn't know about it um, just by targeting to the specific area around your project. Um, and that doesn't necessarily also need to be those virtual digital social media advertisements. Radio and TV advertising works for this too. Sending out mailings, uh, you know, sending out postcards, people who are going to be affected. Uh, you know, again, that question that we talked about uh, on the TV where it pops up during a scheduled public meeting and says, text the number whether you think we should have bike lanes or bus lanes. That could be a 30 second, you know, 15 second spot that runs in between other shows uh, on your, uh, your local broadcast, uh, public broadcast TV station. Uh, and so to be able to collect information that way uh, can be really powerful ways of getting in front of people and really expanding the reach of the kind of groups they can be able to talk to. So now the question would be, why engage, especially amid the ongoing coronavirus outbreak? Well, the answer is simple. In addition to meeting the legal mandates and avoiding further delays, engaging the community would uh, greatly help build stakeholder relationships, social trust, capital, uh, social capital and trust for the ongoing work. Before COVID, we may have decided to just hold a public meeting and implementing that meeting would have included two major steps. One, sending out invitations and two, holding the meeting. However, Given the circumstances, we would require, as Highland Planning calls it, unpacking the entire engagement process. This means breaking up those two steps into seven or eight, which would involve sending out invitations, a pre-meeting survey, sharing materials such as presentations or proposed plans well ahead of time. Also providing them an opportunity to ask questions before the virtual meeting. This will also help expand the scope of the project presentation itself. Then hosting the actual virtual meeting, uh, which can be done using one of the platforms detailed in the spreadsheet shared with you in chat. Six would be seeking feedback from meeting participants through an exit survey immediately after the virtual meeting, and then also following up with stakeholders by sen uh, sending a recording of the meeting along with an online survey or a common form. 
we need to acknowledge and accept the fact that we cannot recreate the entire in-person dialogue experience because obviously people cannot gather in a room and simply talk to each other. So to ensure that we do not lose the efficiency of dialogue, it becomes all the more important to provide that iteration in other ways. Next slide, please. So in these past few months, Highland has extensively brainstormed ways of virtually engaging with stakeholders, as Andre mentioned. We've gathered pertinent exposure and experience by organizing multiple virtual uh, events for a wide array of municipal and other public and private sector entities. To provide you an idea, a few virtual events that we've conducted so far have been listed here. Different features and controls we use depending upon the project needs and objectives and purpose uh, of that particular project. For instance, the stakeholder webinar such as this was organized for a selected group of stakeholders and therefore required registration or RSVP by all attendees. Unlike the live public webinar that was open to all members of the public. To provide you with another example for some of the features that were used, for another project, uh, for another virtual stakeholder workshop, participants were engaged through a small group uh, uh, discussion exercise that we would do generally in an in-person meeting. But in this particular virtual scenario, we divided the participants into small groups using Zoom's breakout room features in order to discuss feasibility of the proposed alternatives for that respective project. Next, please. So while conducting these virtual events, Highland gained invaluable insights. I would like to share here three major lessons that we learned. First, obviously, is reaching out to people without access to computer or internet. As discussed by Andre earlier, this can be done by providing alternative options to, uh, to join the virtual meeting via telephone, radio, or even a television. Also mailing the project materials ahead of time will be really helpful and providing opportunities for stakeholders to offer input over an extended common period of say 30 days. Second is cost. Virtual meetings may be cost effective due to no travel expenses or no event space expenses, for instance. However, there may be additional costs associated with software tools or developing the virtual engagement infrastructure and that is important to be considered. Third is the risk of Zoom bombing, which is a situation when someone takes control of the virtual meeting and maybe even share inappropriate content to those on call. But this too can easily be avoided with technological awareness and the use of technical protection. Zoom, for instance, now provides a security control for all its meetings and the hosts have the ability to lock the meeting once all the known participants have joined or maybe restrict screen sharing or video control features for all or selected participants other than the panelists, of course. Next slide. So moving on to the benefits of virtual engagement or virtual meetings, in fact, in addition to meeting the CDC social distancing requirements, virtual meetings can be a great resource. Increased convenience with no travel requirements or connectivity irrespective of location did result in increased attendance for a live public webinar hosted by Highlands uh, some time back. Virtual meetings also provide the option of closed captioning interpreters and translators that makes the overall engagement process more inclusive. And features such as breakout rooms and polling and Q&A can be used to keep the participants more engaged and attentive throughout the virtual meeting. Another added advantage is the ability to record and broadcast meetings, which can expand the reach even further. Next. So as we adapt to this new normal, virtual meetings continuously grow to be a promising tool that promotes both engagement and productivity. And to harness its full potential, we suggest that virtual tools should be used in collaboration with in-person meetings as complementary techniques of engagement, even in an era post the uh, coronavirus pandemic. And I would now pass it on to Emily. Thank you. So I think um, one of the key takeaways that we really hope everybody um, takes from this is that a balance of both the virtual and traditional communication methods for your project is 
is key in this new world of public engagement. And not just because of COVID, um, but because in general, the world is changing and how people communicate with each other is changing. So these are all tools that we, um, we think and would be good for you, you know, to incorporate into your plans long-term, even when we are in a position um, where everybody can meet at the farmer's market again. Um, there are still um, benefits and opportunities to incorporate um, some virtual engagement in what would have typically just been a traditional environment. And with that, we would um, like to open it up to questions. If anybody has um, questions or things they would like to discuss further, um, we would be happy to do that. Um, so Andy just asked if there was any indication of when FHWA will release their COVID-19 guidelines. Um, as of this morning, their FAQ says that it's under consideration. Um, they did not give an official release date. They do, however, provide quite a bit of information and guidance on virtual public engagement. Um, they started in about 2012. Um, with a task force to look at what you know kind of virtual public engagement looks like so they do provide um, a lot of resources in terms of what you know can be um, used and what their different ideas are as well as some of their opinions on pros and cons of the different things um, but they have not given a timeline for you know covid specific guidance I don't know if there are any other questions um, coming in. Uh, we would really like to thank everybody for joining us. Um, it was great to talk to you. Um, so in lieu of the guidance, they have said um, that it is up to the different sponsors best judgment, um, but you have to show an attempt to reach all populations. Uh, Emily could correct me on this because um, I'm not as familiar as she is with the uh, FHWA guidance, but um, uh, as far as an attempt to reach all populations, you can, uh, when you're doing the sort of uh, digital advertisement that I was mentioning, if you're not familiar with how that works, uh, you can actually uh, use some Facebook targeting. Um, and so to be able to uh, generally, you know, businesses use that to only say, hey, we only want people in this age range or we only want people um, in this income range to uh, see this ad. Um, but you can actually use it in the opposite way. You can say uh, all people from this age to this age in this area and have uh, Facebook uh, send that out and um, then make sure that a wide range of people in your area are notified about that, uh, about that project, whether or not they happen to go looking for it. Um, so I don't know if that takes it into account. Um, but I think that, you know, if, uh, as we're, these guidelines are being refined, it might be something to, uh, worth looking into. Yes, I would say, um, to piggyback on that, as, as with all things um, having to do with the federal aid process, I would recommend um, documenting, you know, what you've done and what you've tried and to, you know, indicate to somebody that you really did make a best effort, um, you know, kind of similar to the DBE requirements that the contractors do um, and just that idea that, you know, of showing somebody that you really did make a best effort to do, to do, you know, and hit everybody. Um, Tom asked a question about if reaching all of the population means providing sign interpreters. Um, I would believe that even the current guidance would say um, you should have them available if somebody were to request them. 
Um, I don't believe you're required to, you know, have them at every meeting, but you should be giving people the opportunity to indicate that they need assistance and then be able to provide it um, if they do. Andre? Um, Facebook and uh, YouTube both uh, create auto-generated um, captions uh, and Zoom does have capability to create auto-generated live captions as well. Um, so obviously those are not created by a person, those are created by a computer and so there can be some issues, you know, with some, there are certain accents or certain um, uh, sound uh, issues where you're not getting, you know, the right sound through. So it, it's not necessarily always word for word, um, but you are also allowed to update those uh, once you have the recording. Um, so uh, I know that not all uh, ASL speakers are fluent in English reading, uh, but many and most are. So um, to be able to uh, add those uh, can help with that as well. Thank you. Um, there's another question regarding, um, you know, do you think that virtual public outreach will have an effect on costs to the sponsors? You know, an increase, decrease, or no change? I think we're early in the process of um, being, you know, kind of in a mode of almost full virtual public outreach um, to know for sure what that looks like long term, but the earlier indications are probably that there's not a change in cost, it's not less cost. Um, because as Charvi was indicating, there are more, more steps and more touch points needed um, to get to everybody and to make sure you're providing the materials for people to review and the Q&A. Um, so at this point, we would probably say it's, there's not a change in cost, there's definitely not a decrease in cost um, is what we're anticipating. Um, and there was a question about where we can find a copy of this webinar. This is Tanya. I'll pipe in to say we can post it on our website or we can we can send it to you if you let us if you let us know where, where you are, who you are. Great. Yeah, we will make it available. Um, we can we have the certainly the print version available and we did record the live version as well. Um, there's a question as well on, um, you know, discussion of the impact on COVID on the traditional FHWA funded projects. Um, I attended a meeting with uh, DOT this earlier this week um, regarding, kind of regarding that. Um, the indication coming out of New York State is that in the absence of some sort of FHWA infrastructure, you know, either a stimulus bill or just a transportation bill, um, that there will be an impact on the ability for um, them to fund projects, um, at least within New York State, um, due to the current budget gap um, without some stimulus funding coming to the state. So they're not anticipating to be able to maintain the current program. Uh, Wahid Albert indicated that by the end of June, DOT will be you know, at a standing halt um, without a transportation stimulus, infrastructure stimulus bill. So that's what DOT is saying. Um, I don't know that FHWA has said anything themselves at this point. So I don't know, it doesn't look like there's other questions coming in right now. You can certainly keep um, putting them in as we're, we're wrapping up here. Um, and uh, my contact information as well as Tanya's is still on your screen. Um, please feel free to reach out to us after this if you have other questions or you need assistance with anything. Um, our biggest message to you is that we're here to help you. Um, we know that it's this is new for everybody, and there's you know where everybody's trying different things, and you know we're here on that ride along with you. So we would be happy to help you in any way you need. Um, so please feel free to reach out to us with questions if you have them. Um, and we're you know very happy that so many of you were able to join us today. Um, hopefully you enjoyed some local food as well, um, and we appreciate having you all. 
and not seeing anything else coming in, I think with that, we will go ahead and wrap up. So thank you very much.